Welcome to the Wickedly Smart Women podcast, featuring stellar conversations with emerging and established Wickedly Smart Women. Thanks for joining us today as we celebrate women who are committed, care deeply, and have the courage to take action and create conscious change all around the world. Now here's your Wickedly Smart host, Angel B. Hartwell. Welcome to another episode of the Wickedly Smart Women podcast, where we celebrate wickedly smart women and provide our listeners with a wealth of wisdom, along with immediately actionable steps to be smarter, spunkier, and more successful in their impact and their leadership. This is your host, Angel B. Hartwell, and today we welcome our special guest, Shana Francesca. Shana is a speaker, writer, and entrepreneur. Her work centers around intentional leadership and life design. Shana believes our present and future are transformed when we infuse our lives with intention, design our lives, honor our place as part of a global community, and realize the power in accepting ourselves as the author of our story. So I'm really excited to have you here today. Welcome to the show, Shana. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So I want to start our time, Shana, by asking, do you, are you the product of an intentional family or did intentionality come to you later down the road? That's a really great question. I am not the product of an intentional family. I am the product of an an abusive family. I am the product of religious trauma. I grew up in an evangelical Christian cult. And so intentionality became my practice, finding my way to intentionality. And I I define intentionality as the combination of curiosity plus respect times practicing accountability, right? And for me, getting curious about what was possible in my life and then learning to set boundaries and create a respectful environment for myself, you know, as I became an adult. And then practicing accountability, what I call practicing cleaning it up, really taught me how to heal and how to be intentional. It kind of just led me right into it. Interesting. Okay. So it's kind of interesting because having come from an evangelical Christian cult, I mean, there is some serious intention that's running behind (laughs) those organizations, right? Correct. So theoretically, you could say you came from an exceptionally intentional you know what (laughs) the way that you're looking at it i i agree with you i did i you know what in that case i came from an exceptionally intentional environment just an exceptionally harmful one (laughs) correct correct yeah and so i want our listeners to really hear that the intention is not always something that's neutral intention can be negative and intention can also be positive and so so for you, Shana, it was really about this this movement away from what for you was not in alignment is what right. I'm hearing, right? right? So can we can you take us back to when you kind of woke up to that? Did you have some kind of spiritual awakening? Did you have some kind of traumatic experience that just was like the last straw? Tell us a little bit more about what actually activated you to get on to this path of intentionality and self-creation? Yeah, it was a little bit of a combination of a few things. So trigger warning before we enter into this aspect of the conversation, what I'm going to talk about is deeply personal and involves sexual assault. So for anyone who might be sensitive to that, please tune out (laughs) at this moment or skip past for a few minutes. I grew up, you know, like I said, I grew up in an evangelical Christian cult. My parents joined evangelical Christianity when I was four. They didn't move into this cult-like church until I was about nine, ten. but I had been going to school associated. So my whole life then, once they went to the church, was wrapped up in going to school five days a week at, at, you know, associated with the church. And then weekends, we would go to church on Sunday. So the only day I wasn't consistently at the church was on Saturday, right? So it paints a very specific picture of my life outside of the house. And then inside of the house being very specifically abusive. And so early on, when I was three, I was raped by my babysitter's son. The thing about abusive people is that they typically do not surround themselves with other healthy people. Healthy people do not spend time 
typically with people who are very obviously significantly dysfunctional and emotionally unintelligent. And so the people my parents surrounded themselves with were just as harmful as they were. And, and so that kind of sets the stage for a few years later, my dad began grooming me. Did I recognize it was grooming? No, I did not. At the age of 12, he forced me to take a chastity pledge in front of my entire church, which was a couple of thousand people. And it felt deeply hurtful to me to do that because in the eyes of the church, I was not a virgin. I was raped at the age of Right. And so I didn't want to make this declaration that I was a virgin and I was going to stay a virgin until I was married, even though I no longer believe in the concept of virgin. I want to make that clear. Mm-hmm. But at the time, I was deeply invested in it because I was a child. And so I was forced to take this pledge. And then three years later, my father sexually assaulted me. Right. Uh, I was able to get away before mm-hmm. anything too significant happened. He did touch me inappropriately, but then I ran away. Right. Mm. And so it was like the last bit of anger that I had in my life was ripped out from underneath of me. I thought my dad is an abusive man, but he would never do this to me. Mm. And when he did that to me mm. was the moment and that I said, F all of this. Mm. Right? It's a bunch of bull crockery. I'm not seeing people actually do what they're saying that I'm required to do. Well, yeah, it's the hypocrisy. The huge Correct. hypocrisy. Correct. And, yeah. and and this culture of this purity culture, and there's a lot, there's a lot that goes into it. Is every church bad? No. Are way too many. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah. so I want to just take a, a pause for at this point because I want to just also speak to you know some of the things in it, it's it's always remarkable to me. There's always something in one of my guest's stories that somehow relates to a part of my life. My son was sexually assaulted in daycare when he was three. Mm. We were not part of that kind of an environment or cult community kind of thing. Yeah. It just, it, it was an experience that happened. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, thankfully he told us, we took him out of that situation, yeah. confronted everything. Yeah. The, the challenge here that I want my listeners to hear is when you don't have a parent who is instantly going to respond appropriately to a massively traumatic experience like that for a child, but instead parents that are, you know, ultimately in your case became abusers themselves. Yeah. The trauma is just, it's just constantly. And and what's, what's also interesting to me, Shana, in your story here is that this cult has this puritanical chastity type yeah. frame of intention. Oh, now we're yeah. talking intention, right? Yeah. And yet underneath, and it's not just in whatever church you were in, but we are now seeing it all over the place. It was in the Catholic church. It's been yeah. in a lot of different church the organizations. Dalai Lama, even the Dalai Lama was just called out. Yeah. And, you know, the Dalai Lama thing was interesting because there is, we have to be mindful of cultural differences too. So for, for the purpose of this conversation, let's keep it within at least the U.S. We definitely have been seeing yeah. massive amounts of revelation of yeah. these purported puritanical organizations yeah. that have this deep, dark underbelly. So you left at 15, which is a huge, yeah. well, a I huge didn't, thing. To- yeah, that's a thing I didn't actually leave. And I want to go back and clean up something really quickly. My okay. parents did have a, my mom especially, had a very appropriate response to me being sexually assaulted. But there was still abuse going on at home, right? There wasn't sexual abuse going on at home, but there was still abuse. And I got therapy and they did remove me from that situation as quickly as possible. But I didn't go to a public daycare at that point. I was going to a private daycare. At that moment, my parents then put me into a public daycare, right? My parents were very poor at the time. And so they they were trying to save money by Mm -hmm. having me be watched by someone's family friend. And so, you know, my parents did, like I said, my parents did the best that they could. And even abusive people, they're not all bad. There's no such thing as all bad people and Mm. all good people. Right. And so there is this, like, I just wanted to make that clarification just so that people understand, you know, my parents, I don't have a relationship with my father anymore, but I do with my mother and we've come a long way in that healing. Yeah. All right. So you left at 15 and had no safety net. So help us to get to the point where you were able to start yeah. activating your own curiosity, respect, yeah. 
accountability formula yeah. that you have yeah. created for yourself. Yeah. So at, fi- at 15, I wasn't able to to leave yet. I, I didn't leave until I was 25, but at 15 mentally, I began to deconstruct, right? Mm. I was not able to leave. I didn't have anywhere to go. Mm. And so I just had to stay and make the best of it. But what I did start to do is what we would now call vision boarding, right? I didn't know that's what I was doing, but that's what I was doing. I took one of my bedroom walls and I would write quotes on index cards uh, that I read in books that I found on calendars because back then we had physical calendars. <laughs> and I would I would put them all up on index cards and they were like a vista, like a view into a world that I did not yet have access to, mm. right? And I would I would tear images out of magazines that you know, my parents would bring me to the doctor's office. We'd sit in the waiting room and I would quietly tear out pages of like, because you weren't allowed to tear out pages, you know, you'd get in trouble. <laughs> so I would tear out these pages of images of things that I, you know, of a home, of a garden, of a, a beautiful tailored suit or dress or something that felt like it was connected to who I was. And I would put it all up over my bedroom walls and I would take the JC Penny catalog and I would circle all the things that I wanted to be part of this life I was crafting for myself inside of my head. And so my imagination and my curiosity began to be my safe place. They were really, it was the only place that I was mm. truly able to be seen, heard and understood as, as truly myself, right? which began this intentionality practice of, of diving into what is possible, what have other people done? And I found mentors through books, Mm. right? Through finding authors that gave me views of their own life story. And even just, even if their life story had zero parallels to my own, it allowed me to see that other people have different lives and that perhaps it's possible for me to have a different That was Yeah. Beautiful. I love this. Okay. So we're already at the break. It's amazing how fast this goes, but I really want to underscore this idea of books and stories were a, they were fuel for you. They were nourishing for you. They gave you, they opened up, you know, especially when you're a young person or a child that you're dependent upon adults and you're in this cult situation where you're surrounded by a community of people that are all reiterating this belief system that's dysfunctional, it's really, really amazing that you were able to have that opening and to be able to start the process of activating your own vision through stories and books and quotes and so forth. So we're going to take a quick break, but right now, we could leave smart women, we could use your help. If you are enjoying this show, please consider joining our community, making a donation at www.wickedlysmartwomen.com and sharing with your lovely lady friends that might benefit from our content. Help a gal out and let your sisters, mothers, daughters, friends, and colleagues know about the show so that we can serve them too. I want to say a huge thank you to all of our listeners who are downloading and rating and reviewing. I also want to shout out and let you know that we have our second volume of Wickedly Smart Women. Trusting Intuition, Taking Action, and Transforming Worlds. And as Shana was talking before we came to the break here about how important it was for her to see other people's stories, we are inviting you to consider putting your story in our next collaborative book. Our first book was a number one hot new release in six categories, became an international bestseller, and was allowed all of the co-authors to become international bestsellers as well. So if you have a powerful story, it doesn't necessarily have to be a story of trauma, although those trauma to triumph stories can be incredibly inspiring for people who are in situations that really need that bridge out by being able to see that others are able to get out as well. We also welcome, you know, other kinds of inspirational stories and So we are delighted to have you reach out and let us know if you'd be interested in finding out more about that. We'll hook you right up with our publisher. We are welcoming thousands of downloads from all over the world. I want to shout out this week to our listeners in Tajikistan, our listeners in Norway, and our listeners in Panama. And we will be right back with Shana Francesca. The Wickedly Smart Women podcast is brought to you by The Wealthy Life Mentor. 
Women, are you on the edge knowing that life is calling you to make a change? Are you ready to be part of the evolution of what it means to be a wickedly smart woman creating your wealthy life by design? A life that is an extraordinary work of art. Angel B. Hartwell, the Wealthy Life Mentor, is hired by women in transition. Women just like you who want to break through to their brilliance, become clear on the value of their wisdom, and embody a beauty-filled, balanced life of shameless self-expression. Discover your Wealthy Life readiness by taking the quiz at quiz.wealthylifementor.com. And we are back with Shana Francesca. You can find out more about Shana at consonate.world. And we will have that for you in the show notes so that you aren't going to make a mistake on that. So Shana, let's talk about, you know, you were able to create this vision for yourself. You started to activate your curiosity. You began to ultimately get yourself out of there mentally right? You got yourself out of there mentally, emotionally, spiritually, you know, physical body was still there, but the rest of you was basically out. Why don't you fast forward us to what inspired you to become a speaker, a writer, an entrepreneur, and how do you help people now based on these experiences that you had yourself and what you did to escape from traumatic background? Once I started to recognize in my own life as a teenager how important my physical environment became and was, I began to kind of lean into what would that look like as a profession. And the closest thing I could find was an interior designer. And so that's what I went to school for. I have a BS in interior design. I was always looking for this deeper way of truly connecting with people through their physical environment and the ways in which our physical environment is a reflection of our beliefs about ourselves and the way it should support us, not us, it right? And that it becomes and can be the stage from which we tell the story of our life, not in a performative way, but in the way that when you see the set of a play, it supports the actors and the story that they're telling, right? And so it was incredible to be an interior designer, but there was always this aspect of me approaching my clients from a place of, who are you? What's your story? Where do you want your story to go from here? In a world with no rules, what would we create? Mm -hmm. What do you want to be happening in these physical environments, right? And then I become the mirror reflecting back to them how I interpreted those things. I'm creating these deeply authentic environments. I've never had a signature style as an interior designer, never intended to have. But ultimately, I noticed that my clients, my clients started saying to me, you know, you're like maybe 50 to 60% life coach. (laughs) Like, you know, so they would, they were telling people, oh, she's my interior designer and my life coach. And then I started doing group coaching and I started having speaking engagements. And I started to recognize that I didn't necessarily need to be the one always designing the physical environment. I needed to be having these conversations with people about living their lives intentionally and then intentionally creating space around them and intentionally creating community around themselves. Because Design is a function of intention, Mm -hmm. right? Right? And so when when we design our lives, right, we begin to recognize that intention bleeds into every aspect of it. And I truly, deeply believe that our home is the place which we practice intentionality and we begin with small things that start to build up on top of each other that cue our brain into paying attention to where we can become and it bleeds out into our professional life, our leadership, it bleeds out into every other aspect of our lives. And so that became this, this connection between interior design as we know it, right? Mm. Of, of physical environments and interior design of ourselves. Yeah. Which I encapsulate under, I call life design, but really is about intentional living and leadership. Beautiful. Well, I love this idea of the interior designer becomes the interior yeah. designer. And and here at the at the Palace of Pleasures, this is where I live right now, is the Palace of Pleasures. I also agree with you that everything here must support and nourish me. And having, you know, I came from the generation, I guess they now call it Generation Jones, right? Where everybody was jonesing for what the Joneses had. Right. Right. And so there was a lot of cultural conditioning, a lot of 
expectations set by advertising and programming that said, you know, you need the colonial house on 1.3 acres with the dog in the yard and the two cars in the garage yeah. and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And, you know, it was escaping from that, both the mindset as well as the actual setting yeah. that was significant for me as well. Yeah. So yeah. I love this idea of curiosity, respect, and accountability, but I'm even more curious about the word consonate, Shana, yeah. because it's such an interesting word that you taught me when we were in the green room before we went yeah. on to the show. So I'd love to have you speak about your intent behind yeah. choosing that word for your virtual i i mean for me it's like everything here is an altar like my entire house is an altar and when we go onto a website that is our altar as well it's our virtual altar of how we are signaling to the world that we would like our business to be perceived and so forth yeah. so talk yeah. about consonate please yeah so let's start with the definition mm -hmm. consonate means to arrange or blend together skillfully as parts or elements put together in a harmonious, precisely appropriate or elegant manner. And I really loved the part where when, as soon as I found this word, I love the part where it was said to arrange or blend together skillfully, right? And then to harmonious, precisely appropriate or elegant manner, right? Precisely appropriate. Mm -hmm. And precisely appropriate is not perfection, right? right? Because perfection is idyllic and it really doesn't exist because if we want perfection, right? Or we seek perfection from ourselves, we'll be good at only one thing, absolutely nothing, because there's no such thing, mm -hmm. right? And so to try to flip that and move that and alter that view to it being precisely appropriate for me, right? Mm -hmm. Moving away from the homogeneity that we see that is, that is sold to us, that we need to participate in to be enough, to be good enough, to be seen as enough. And so much of what you're talking about of how you grew up is, is a measure of someone's value and worth being based off of their ability to consistently consume. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, exactly. But we have to ask ourselves, you know, we are as human beings consistently consuming, but what are we consuming? Does its energy belong with us? Does it align with who we are? Who are we? How do we quiet those voices? How do we release that which is no longer serving us or never did in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. And to really, truly get in touch with our own voice, our inner voice, right? And so consonate, when I read this definition, it was everything I needed it to be just wrapped up in one word. And so I was like, yes, that's it. <laughs> that's what we're doing. We're creating precisely appropriate environments, both interior inside of people, right? And in their physical environments and, and, and how those things are tethered together. Beautiful. So Shana, let's talk about what your big vision is moving forward from here. Like, what do you want to create with Consonate in the lives of your clients, in your own life and in the world itself? Joy. Mm -hmm. Joy. Joy. Yeah. So I, I want to invite our listeners to just take a nice little breath there and let us remember to, you know, one of the pieces of guidance that we're getting here from Shana is that we need to understand ourselves, like precisely for me, okay. precisely for me, the joy that I take in my world may not be consonate <laughs> with the joy that you create in your world. You might be somebody for whom joy is being a mechanic in the garage, fixing the 1967 Mustang for 27 hours on the weekend. Mm -hmm. Whereas my joy might be going out foraging for wild mushrooms and making a beautiful dish out of food that I've foraged from, mm. from the forest. So Shana, let's talk in the last just couple of minutes that we have here. What do you want to share with our audience here at the end that is either going to help them to see whether or not it would be fun to become a client of yours? Like, do you yeah. have a client success story you'd like to share or, you know, any last little pieces that you feel are important to drop in? Yeah. I want to share this quick story. I was talking to a group of people about what life design is and a woman approached me after and she said, I really want to thank you. You changed how I view, you know, what it is to be intentional and, and she said, you know, I'm, I'm in, the, in the middle of a divorce and I have these posters all over my apartment and I know I have to take them down. So thank you for your talk. And I was like, hold on, 
hold on, do you have a minute? Can we dive into that? And she said, absolutely, yes. And I said, what are the posters of? She said, concerts. And I said, great. Did you go to those concerts? She said, yeah. Are they bands you love? Yes. Well, did you have any of those posters on the wall while you were married? No. And they said, well, perhaps those posters are something that remind you of your wild, right? Mm-hmm. And, and the posters don't necessarily need to come down. Maybe it's not whether or not they belong there, but how they belong there, right? And maybe the difference is they need to be framed and honored more, not taken down and removed, right? Mm. There's that precision. (laughs) Correct. That's the precision, right? It's giving ourselves permission to take up space beautifully and intentionally rather than haphazardly. She put them up because she felt like she, in the way that she did, because she felt like she didn't have a right for them to be there. But what I say is that other people's opinion of you, like Brene Brown says, other people's opinion of you are none of your business. Mm -hmm. And it especially doesn't belong in your home, especially if it's out of alignment with who you are. So honor yourself more. Be more intentional about how you're honoring yourself and don't ask for anybody's permission. I love that. That's beautiful. So I I will just put a quick appendage on that. When I divorced my first husband, he never wanted me to put anything on the walls. And as soon as he was out the door, I was putting stuff on walls and I was painting and I was changing the furniture and yeah, Yeah. making it mine, making it mine without shame, you know, shamelessly expressing myself and remembering, I love your work around like, let's let us differentiate ourselves from the homogeneity that we have been spoon fed to buy into. Beautiful Shana. Well, it's been a pleasure to have you here today and we are at the end. So listeners, we do love feedback. Please let us know what you think of today's episode. Go right now to www.wikilysmartwomen.com to join our community, share your takeaways, ask questions, or submit guest suggestions. Thank you so much for tuning in. Keep your ears open. And remember, you are a wonderful woman. Thanks for tuning in, downloading, and listening. Be sure to rate and review Wickedly Smart Women on Apple Podcasts and share with other women who can benefit from today's episode. Wickedly Smart Women is the premier podcast series for informing, activating, and inspiring the leader who carries profound wisdom and knows that now is the time to welcome wealth. We welcome your feedback and guest suggestions and invite you to subscribe to our mailing list to be notified of each new episode at wickedlysmartwomen.com.